Renee and I had the opportunity yesterday to go to the Idaho State Prayer Breakfast over there in Boise. We got to shake hands with the governor and got to see some of the, some of the dignitaries, some of our councilmen, some of the, you know, it was just an awesome experience. Thanks to Rich and Kathy. Thank you so much for that wonderful time, for uh, inviting us, hosting us. And at that breakfast, this was just something that, uh, that really stood out to me. They read a prayer, or they read a verse, and, and there was plenty of time, prayer breakfast, so there was, there was definitely prayer that took place there. But they read a, a verse that just stood out to me because it fit right into the message that I've been working on. So I just want to read from the, the, the bulletin that we got at the prayer breakfast. Isaiah 58 6 through 9. It is not this kind of fasting is not. Let me just start over. Are you ready? Is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? It's not is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them, not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, your healing will quickly appear, then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You'll cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. And what, what Rich was just saying, that, you know, we are to bear up one another's burdens, that that's what we're here for. God created you with a plan and a purpose for your life, and he has given each one of us gifts, talents, and he's poured anointing over us. And the reason that he has given you those gifts, when I look out over this congregation and I just see faces, I mean, I know there's gifting and there's talents. I know very specific gifts that some of you have been given, both spiritual gifts and both natural gifts, and talents that you have. And some of you are incredibly already, incredibly anointed in certain areas of your life. And God has given you those blessings, those gifts, those talents, that anointing to bless others. Your gifts and talents are for you to be able to bless somebody else. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of servanthood, that our thoughts are to serve. He didn't give you his glory. He didn't give you those gifts and talents. He didn't touch you, appear to you, just so you could wrap yourself up in a glory cocoon, put your feet up, and just, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you've given me. I am just content. No, no, no. That's not what it's all about at all. You have been given to be a blessing. I got a, the title of my message this morning is God's Perfect Timing. I want to start with a, a story about, I've told you about my children. I have four children. I'm incredibly proud of each and every one of those children, each of them with different gifts and, and talents and we'll say anointings over their life. But this morning I want to talk a little bit about my oldest son, Sean. I can't believe that he turned 37 here just a couple months ago. It's like, wow. I think that probably would have made me about 10 when he was born. Uh, somewhere in there. The rest of this is a true story, though. Okay? Um, a little bit about Sean. He is a man's man. He's an outdoorsman. He loves to hunt. He loves to fish. He loves to shoot. Uh, he's a sports nut when it comes to softball 
and basketball because that's where he's coached his, his kids. He's got three awesome kids. We have eight grandchildren, biological grandchildren right now, and, and two that have been adopted into the family. Renee and I have ten grandkids. Can you believe that? It's like, wow. Anyway, Sean, in, in, in his uh, loving to shoot, loving to hunt, he ended up, uh, how many of you have seen or been a part of or maybe even done the, the cowboy shoot thing where they dress all up like cowboys and, and uh, they go, he, he had a uh, Ruger Vaquero, it's the long Colt 45, the old fashioned 45s, you know, six shooter, got the holster and the whole bit. Well, Sean in, entered the, the competition, the cowboy shoot competition. He was really getting into that. And, uh, man, when they, it's complete with attire. Not only do they have to have special guns and, and all, but it's complete with the attire. He had the, the duster, the long coat that goes down, and the hat and the boots, but he was a cowboy anyway, so that part just kind of, that part came natural. But the rest of all that attire, old western attire, and then they show up and they shoot targets. They do everything from quick draw and shoot the old lever action 30-30s at targets and, and all. And, and Sean was be entering these competitions. And one day he had gone to one of these competitions. And so he's geared up, complete with the hat, the boots, the whole outfit, and got his hog leg strapped on, you know, his, his quick draw 45 there. And he had just come back from that competition. He pulled into his driveway, which wasn't really a driveway, it's just kind of off-street parking where he lived. <clears throat> and as he, late afternoon, came back from the shoot, the competition, pulled in the driveway, and just across the street behind him, he saw in the mirror uh, a truck pull up. Just to, so it's like probably 60 feet away from him. It pulled up there, and a uh, little commotion taking place, and it was a, a, a duly lower dually truck with four doors and five young adults piled out of that thing and there was noise and, and Sean looked in his mirror and just much to his dismay because these kids of mine have been raised to know men to know how to treat a woman, women to know how to respect and how to treat a man. That's how I raised my kids. Well, he looked in his mirror and, and the commotion that he was seeing, jumping out of this truck were, were five young adults, I'll say kids because they were, you know, less than 37 years old. And uh, the, one of the young men started, they, they got really noisy and loud, and he started slapping this girl around, and he gave her a shove, and then he hit her, and Sean said, Sean jumped out of his truck as he was, you know, getting things ready to go in, getting his ammunition all put together. And he jumped out of his truck and said, Hey, you knocked that off. What do you think you're doing? That's a woman you're, a girl that you're slapping. You don't treat women like that. What? And the kid just squared off and looked at him. And this is just across the street, probably as far maybe from here as the back door of the sanctuary, probably that far. He then grabbed his girlfriend, this girl, girlfriend, it appeared, by the throat, put his foot behind her and just right on her back, just boom, right there on the gravel. So, Sean was certainly not willing to just let this injustice pass. He took off walking across the street. He got about to the middle of the street and there were three guys and two girls. There were five. They got out of the truck. And, you know... Two of these guys were absolutely fine with that, the other two guys. And two of these girls, absolutely fine. They did nothing but watch. Sean got to the middle of the street, and the kid squared off, pulled up his sweatshirt, and he had a gun stuck in his, in his pants right there. Yeah, oh no. <laughs> You're right, Louie, oh no. Sean stopped right in the middle of the street, this is like showdown at the OK Corral because he doesn't have all his stuff put away yet. He pulls back his duster, <laughs> showing the hog leg there. He takes another step towards that kid and he says, Go ahead, but you better be fast. <laughs> so he's just come back from a competition, you see. <laughs> 
That kid, I'm sure, thought that he just had a nightmare of a standoff at the OK Corral or something. It's like, this cowboy is nuts. What Sean had seen was an incredible injustice that had just taken place, and he has come to the rescue. Well, what that kid then did was dropped his sweatshirt, turned, ran behind the truck, and then phew, he was gone. <clears throat> <clears throat> I believe that that was a change in that little girl's future. Amen. That that was a chance for her to have a complete change of destiny. Yeah. Because she saw somebody step up, somebody that cared for her, for her well-being, for her future, for, for her right now, that said, this is absolutely wrong and I won't stand for this. Amen. It is so much easier for us to see something like that, to turn our back and go, that really isn't my business right there. That's not my business. But it is our business. When something like that is taking place, it is up to you and up to me to right some of those wrongs. Because that young girl... The, the three, the four other people that were there were, were putting their approval stamp, like, this is okay. This is normal. This is something that you need to endure. This is not, this is not, not weird. This is not, but Sean is absolutely, this is not okay, and I'm going to step up here. I'm going to make a change. Now, I believe that when he stepped up there for that young lady, and she realized that this is not okay, that there is a hope for my future. I don't have to put up with this kind of stuff. Because, you know, where he lived was probably five blocks from Albertsons, probably four blocks from the police station. She could have taken off. She could have ran. She could have left that environment. But it's something that had been put into her mind that she didn't have the value. She didn't understand who she was and that this wasn't okay. And when I take a look at what we're going to get into next here, the self-esteem, the true identity is something that so many kids today are struggling with. Not having that, that identity, that confidence, that hope for the future to be able to walk away and say, this is not okay. This is not who I am. I don't have to put up with this kind of stuff. This is craziness. It's because today, so many homes, there are not fathers in the home telling their daughters how special they are, how beautiful they are, that they are the prize that need to be won. Instead, they're, they're, they're wondering who they are. They're wandering about, a little bit confused, sometimes a little bit dazed. I just... Mariah, would you just stand up? <laughs> I just believe this morning that you need to hear how beautiful you are, how special you are, that God created you to be something absolutely special. You are uniquely... <laughs> well, you might as well just wait right here now. Okay. That you are uniquely you. He created you beautiful. He created you special. And he gave you some gifts, and he gave you some talents. And he wants you to be able to live a life completely free, no injustice, no bondage, you know, no yokes. That when it says that it would break the, break the yokes, I just see that, that sometimes we end up, everybody know what a yoke is? A yoke is a big leather thing that's put around a horse so it can drag something. So it can become a beast of burden, so it can, you know, can drag, can carry. And I just believe that all of the yokes 
He wants all of those broken away from you and that you, in your uniqueness, in all what he's created you to do and who he's created you to be, that he has somebody just as unique that is absolutely going to appreciate who you are. And in his timing, everybody say his perfect timing, timing. he's going to show you that Prince Charming of yours that's going to love you, that's going to appreciate you, that it's going to encourage you in in your creativity, in, in, in all of the gifts and the things and the dream that God's put in your heart, in your head, and in your spirit. God's going to bring that person to you to be your soulmate, the one that just absolutely appreciates you. You're the gift. You're the prize, and don't you forget that. Don't you settle for anything less than that man that is going to appreciate you for all that you are and who that you are. God bless you. You're awesome. Oh, Chance, you're highlighted to me right now. You might as well just come right on up here. Chance Beely, God has created you, tall, dark, and handsome, an athlete, you've got athleticism, you have a, a, a wild and crazy sense of humor, you're just an awesome man of God. He has created you to be the priest of your home, the head of your home, and that you are to be loved and appreciated by some young lady that will honor you, that will hold you in high esteem, that will never speak negative or demeaning words to you, but will continue to be your encouragement, that, 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 will, that, that man, when you come home to her, you're just happy to come home because she's the one that's encouraging you. She's the wind beneath your wings. And you don't settle for anything less than that. Anybody that... that, 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 that that isn't uplifting, that isn't encouraging, that isn't lifting you up to be the man that God has called you to be, that isn't encouraging and strengthening you, making your back stand just a little bit straighter, that's not the one God has for you, Chance. Be patient and wait because God's timing is perfect and He's got somebody just picked out for you. God bless you. There are two things in our society that I believe are identity stealers that are causing a generation of kids to be like the one that I was talking about that's slapping the girl around, that actually defiantly just shoved her to the ground right in front of my son one time. <laughs> but, and that is divorce, and pornography. You know, the, the, the kids are the ones that end up in a state of confusion. When divorce happens in a home, it's not their fault. They're the innocent bystanders that end up suffering through the whole process, and some continuing to suffer for the rest of their lives until they're able to process that it was not their fault, that they had nothing to do with it, that they were innocent in, the, in this whole thing. And the other is pornography. When I, when I think of what pornography does, I mean, we get an opportunity to do plenty of counseling, and we did celebrate recovery, so I got to see the, the, the things, the damage that, that happens in lives, in families. But in children, in young men, when, when they have become addicted, you know, internet pornography is, is, is just crazy. When you look uh, through the congregation and think for men, every other one now in the church, every other one has struggled with pornography to, to some degree. And what pornography does to, in the minds of men, young men, old men, any men, what it does is totally demean women and the way that God has created them and what they are to be, how we are to see them, is totally distorted because we begin to see them 
as objects rather, rather than princes and princesses. See, girls as princesses that God has created, the prize that is to be won, instead they're now seen as objects, objects to satisfy a lustful desire, the desire of the flesh. So that, man, that whole, that, that, the whole paradigm, the way that, that girls should be seen by men, young and old, is totally twisted and perverted. Is this making sense? And divorce, right now, I was just looking at statistics, 41% of first-time marriages are now failing. 41%. 4 out of 10, a little over 4 out of 10. Second marriages, 60% fail. So if you can't get it right the first time, your chances are 50% worse for the second time. The third time, third time marriages, 73% percent fail. And when I start to take a look at both pornography and divorce, which is something that is so hard, so on this next generation, which is causing frustration, anger, resentment, self-loathing even. Some kids hate themselves and they don't even understand and they don't even know why. There's bitterness and there's resentment. Why? Because what they're seeing happen and what is happening to them as the innocent bystanders. When I think of the greatest reason, when I, when I think of divorce and, and look at divorce, I think, you know, what, what happens? You know, we are called to be helpmates, we're called to be encouragers, but when divorce, when a family starts to break apart, the biggest reason that I have now seen, I've in 60 years started to figure out, it has to do with self. We put self here and then put a little dash, ish. Self, ish. Self, serving. I deserve better. I want more. I, you know what? I, I probably, uh, I can go into all kinds of sc scenarios, but I really believe that, you know, and it takes two. So when I'm talking to, to you, if you've been through a divorce, I, boy, I am absolutely not condemning anybody. I'm just talking for the future, for this church, for this nation, that we have got to be looking at the situation at families and the strength of families because that's the hope for our nation. When we start to look at, at, at the big self, the all, the great big I, when that I gets bigger and bigger, Rich called me, Rich, sound guy Rich, called me a few days ago and he says, Pastor Lynn, I, just, I, I feel like I just got a revelation. I was praying and I was studying and he says, and I just heard something from the Lord. I said, well, what, what? He says, there is no I in the Lord's prayer. It's like, oh, that is good. That is good. Lead us not into temptation. Uh, deliver us from evil. It's, it's not all about I. When we, when we start to think about, yeah, but I deserve better. I have these needs. I, 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 I. When we are called to be servants, we're called to be encouragers, we're called to be helpmates, to raise up, to help one another out. That's the same thing in our house. You know, that's a, what you're supposed to be to your wife. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and was willing to die for her. Amen. Wives, submit to your husband, which means that you love and respect your husband, that you put them in a position of being able to be the priest of their home, to be the leader in their home. Respect your husband. All right. <clears throat> If you'll turn with me to when I talk about, about what children suffer, that, that they're the ones that are on the suffering end of this. If you'll turn with me to uh, 21st chapter of Genesis, I'm going to read 14 through, we're going to look at 14 through 21 anyway.
I want to give you just a little bit of background. Abraham and Sarah, we, we all know the story of, I think we all know the story of Abraham and Sarah, how they both got to be pretty old. They hadn't had any kids, and Abraham had been promised that his seed was going to be as many, he was going to have a, as many descendants as stars in the sky. He was going to have, a, and sands on the beach, that his, he was going to have many, 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 and he's 90 years old and doesn't have any kids yet, or up in his late 80s, something he doesn't have any kids yet. So his wife starts thinking, you know, I really want a kid. I really want a kid. How are we going to do this without, without having a child first? So she started to kind of outsmart God. Let's just come up with a plan. I know God said this, so there's some way that this is going to happen. So, uh, so Sarah gave her handmaiden, Hagar, to her husband so she could produce for her a child. That's the way the word of the Lord is going to happen. It's going to come true because Hadar, Hagar will produce this child. Now, my thinking is, Sarah, probably, if this is going to be her child that this handmaiden is going to produce, I know that they had more than one servant, probably looked around a little bit to find the prettiest one as well. You want to have a good-looking kid, right? You want your boy to be a handsome boy. So, anyway, that happened. Uh, Hagar, Abraham, they had a child. Now, there were relationship, let's just say there were relationship problems. Definitely relationship problems. After this child was born, this child's name was Ishmael. And, uh, boy, Sarah just wasn't all that excited anymore about, about this other child. You know, when we have families now, when, when you look at the divorce rate, and you look at blended families. That's something that so many people now end up having to deal with, is the issue of blended families, right? I mean, we could raise hands and we could take a look and see how many people come from blended families, how many people have stepbrothers and stepsisters and, and all that. Well, Sarah was so disturbed that when she finally got her own son, so this turns into the real blended family thing. There are two stepbrothers now. Sarah got her own son, and she said, you know what, it's time. This one, this boy of yours and Hagar's, you need to hit the road. This is not working out. So it turned into a separation, a family separation, much like how we experience divorce today, you know, and blended families, the struggles and the issues that come in a blended family situation. Well, here's where we pick up. They, Abraham has finally decided, yeah, that's what's got to happen. So the split took place, much like divorce, the separation is gone. So he has made the settlement. He packed her a bag of food. He gave her a skin of water, sent her and her son off. They hit the road. Now, I just think of the... He was about junior high age, middle school, like 13, 14 years old, when Ishmael had to end up going through this. He had lived in the house with his father, a mother and father situation, a little less than ideal, but a mother and father situation in the same house. He had that security. Abraham was no poor guy either, so he, you know, he, he did pretty well. Ishmael was accustomed to a, a pretty good living there in that home. But he was sent out with his mother. The settlement had been made, decided, and Hagar didn't come out all that well. She got a bag full, of, a lunch bag full of stuff and a water, and she and her son were sent to the wilderness. Not a very good settlement there. But her, now being a single mom with a 13, 14-year-old kid, out to the wilderness. She's got no particular skills. She was a, a servant girl in the house of Abraham to, to Sarah. So she's leaving, going out with her son, no, no real skill set, sent out to the wilderness. I mean, does this paint a picture for anybody? And here's where we pick up 14th verse. So Abraham rose early in the morning took bread and a skin, of water, a skin of water, putting it on her shoulder. He gave it to her and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water in the skin was used up, and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot 
For she said to herself, Let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him, lifted her voice, and wept. Pretty much a point of real despair right now. She didn't know where to go. She didn't know what to do. Now it's time to call on God. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Many, many kids, children, from little kids on up now, are going through a time where, where mom and dad are not together. And they, and they are going through this time of, of desperation, of frustration. Many single moms are now out on their own, and they didn't go with a big purse full of money or anything. that They have now, they have to make their way. And where their real hope is, you know what? God is there. God is the answer. When they cried out to God, he heard the lad right where he is. The situation that he's at, the location that he's in, God heard his cry, and God responded. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So they cried out to God, and he responded. Pull the veil off, open your eyes. Here's a well of water. Then she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad. God heard his voice where he was at. God came and was with the lad. Two really important verses right here. So God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. Now, Ishmael could have absolutely had the anger, had bitterness, and hated his father for what he had done to him and his mother. Wouldn't, he, wouldn't that just make perfect sense? But no. He called on the Lord, and God came, and God was with him. She raised her son. He didn't, it doesn't speak of her end up marrying again of having another of him having another father she raised her son he became a he raised 12 princes that became leaders of 12 tribes so she raised the boy she picked him out a wife and god was with him blessed him in that situation so when Abraham was old and passed away, Ishmael and Isaac went together and buried him. So did he resent his father? Did he hate his father? Was there bitterness? It certainly doesn't show or doesn't say in here. Because God played the part of the father, of the missing father, in the life of Ishmael. Thank you, Jesus. We, just, we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Father, that when we go through difficult times, when we go through difficult situations, when it seems that there is no hope, Father, that you are there. Thank you, Jesus, that we can call on your name. In our time of distress, Father, we can call on your name, and you are there. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. If you will turn with me Isaac the son of the, the son of promise 24 uh, 24th chapter we're going to look at, at take a look at the life of of Isaac the 24th chapter now, there's, there's too much here to read, so I just want to 
again, build some background into this story. When Isaac was ready for a wife, Isaac has now turned 40 years old, and it's time for him to marry. It's time for Isaac to start spreading the, the seed, where all of these descendants. So Abraham is ready to help select just the right wife. When you think of the promises that have been spoken over Abraham, through Isaac, who's the promised son, the one that's, that's going to be the promise, the seed, uh, the, Isaac w or Abraham definitely wanted to make sure that this boy got the right wife because this is going to be the mother of all the promise, right? So he said, I don't want you to be choosing a woman from around here. I'm going to go back to the home, my home country because you have to select the right one. This has to be the perfect wife. This is the one that's going to mother all of this, this seed. Okay, so we will pick up on the 12th verse right here. Abraham spoke to his, the servant that had been his in his home along with his most trusted servant, said, now I want you to go, go to the home country, and I want you to select this wife for my son. And if she won't come back with you, he says, then just promise me that you'll go, that you'll bring a wife back, the right wife for my son. God will go with you. The angel will go before you. Guaranteed, you're going to get the right woman. So his servant indeed was obedient to him. He took off. He hit the road. He put together gifts of gold, gold rings, gold bracelets, gold nose ring, uh, camels, all kinds of things to take with him for gifts to make sure that this is going to happen. This has got to be a successful venture for him. Well, he took off to go get that wife, and when he, when he got there, I mean, he had prayed to the Lord, God, please, please, please. Uh, he said, O oh Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be, and now this is the prayer, the very specific prayer that he's praying, now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, Please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, Drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one whom you've appointed for your servant Isaac. So he's prayed a very specific prayer. You know, please let her say that when the one that says this, she's going to be the woman. She's going to be the wife. So he had prayed this prayer, and no sooner had he finished praying that pray, prayer before he even finished speaking that, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. I'm sure he was, oh, thank you, Lord. I hope this is the one. I hope this is the one. Now the young woman was a very beautiful to behold, a virgin. No man had known her. And she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. So she said, drink, my Lord. And he's going, oh, yes, this is looking good. Then she hastened and let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. And he's, yes! <laughs> then she hastened and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran back to the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man... Wondering at her, remained silent as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. So it was when the camels had finished drinking, the man took a golden nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing ten shekels of gold and said, Whose daughter are you? Tell me, please, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? And she said, Yes. She explained who who she was, and God had absolutely come through, had answered his prayer. He had heard a word from the Lord. Abraham sent his son to get just the right wife, and it was a completely successful mission. Now listen, we, we, the blessing over Abraham, spoken over Abraham about his son Isaac, that, that his seed would be so many, that there would be so many, and that... I just want to read the, 
when Rebecca was ready to go, I'm trying to hurry this now a little bit, when Rebecca had decided, yes, I will go with this man, I mean, the story goes that they asked Rebecca, bring her down, let's ask her, and she said, yes, I will go with him. Yes, I will go with this man. Uh, she, she knew that it was from the Lord, that this was to be her husband. Yes, I will go with him. The blessing that her family spoke over her, and they knew nothing of the blessing of Abraham's blessing. They knew nothing of the blessing over Isaac. This is the blessing that they spoke over, over her. Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands. That sounds like a lot. Maybe not quite as much as the stars or the, or the sand yet. Thousands of ten thousands, though, spoken over her. And may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. And the blessing over Abraham was, may your, descendants, may your descendants possess the gates of your enemy. So God was working on both ends of this thing, speaking the blessing over them, the blessing over Rebekah, the blessing over, over Isaac. Just like I'm talking about, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. He has a mate picked out for you. It's when we get our flesh involved, when we get antsy, when we get anxious, and we start trying to make it happen quicker is when we run into problems. This morning, I just think of, now, that promise, she came, they were, they were married. Uh, he was 40 years old. It was 20 years before she had her first child. 20 years that they waited to see the fulfillment of those prophetic words. Because, everybody say again, God's perfect, timing. God's perfect timing. So Isaac was 60 years old when, when he ended up beginning to see his seed start to grow and develop and, and descendants. Because God's timing is perfect timing. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans, the thoughts that I have for you, and it's thoughts for good, for peace, not for evil. I want to prosper you. I want you to have the right husband. I want you to have the right wife. I want you to serve me with all of the gifts and talents that I've given you. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for our good, for those who are in Christ Jesus, called according to his purpose. He's got a purpose for you. He's gifted you for that purpose. And for each one of us, it's to serve others. You are gifted and talented to be a blessing to others. Not to wrap yourselves in that glory cocoon and just enjoy what he's done for you. But the thought that I want you to have this morning is that he saw the lad at the low point, at his point of need. He heard the lad's cry where he was at. And he responded. And he said, I have a plan for you. I have a blessing for your life. And if everyone would just stand. If we could have the prayer team come down this morning, we're ready for a prayer team. This morning, as we consider all that God has given to us, all that He wants to give to us, all that He has for us, he loves you so much. He wants to bless your life. And wherever you are right now, wherever you are right now, He knows your name. He sees your need. And He is ready to respond, saying, I heard the lad's voice right where he was at. So where you are this morning, if, it's, if you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, to be your Savior, you want Him to lead you. You want Him to guide you. You want Him to come into your heart. I just encourage you to come down because this is a team that will be able to lead you through that. 
If you just need this morning a word of encouragement, if you need somebody to pray with you this morning, because you need a word of encouragement for where you are, for where your walk is, if you're finding yourself under that, under that bush feeling like you're just ready to die, you're ready just to give it up, God, where are you? If you need to cry out to Him this morning, just encourage you as we close to come to the front, to come on up here and let somebody speak a word of encouragement over you. Let somebody pray for you. The Bible says one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. Well, we've got a whole row of people up here that are just ready to pray with you, to, 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 to speak words of encouragement over you. If you need to recommit, if you want to commit your gifts and talents to the Lord this morning, if you want to just hand it to Him for Him to give it back to you blessed and show you, so He can show you where he wants you to use that gift, who you need to bless, the kind of blessing that you need to be, I encourage you, come up here and just give it to the Lord this morning. In fact, I'd just like everybody this morning, just for a few minutes, to just gather around the altar. Let's just, let's just pray together and offer our gifts up to the Lord that he will put blessing on those gifts and if there's anything you need if there's a healing that you need in your body if you need a touch if you need an encouraging word you're gonna receive it here this morning just, just give you a couple seconds to come on up here let's just have a, a, a prayer time together this morning now if you'll just reach your hands out like you're giving something away Father, and we'll pray together. Father, I want all that you have for me. I want to be a blessing. I want to be a blessing in the lives of others, Father. So everything that you have given me, every gift, every talent, every blessing that you've poured out in my life, Father, I offer it to you right now that you, Father, would bless it that you would give it back to me blessed, that I would be able to use it for your glory. I commit myself to you. Let's all say that together. I commit myself to you, Lord. I thank you. I praise you. I accept everything that you have for me. And in obedience, Father, I will do what you ask me to do with the gifts and talents you've given to me. Because my desire is to bless others. Jesus, 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 you are the answer. In my time of need, you're the answer, Lord God. I thank you for the blessings. I praise your mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, I just pray a blessing over each one that's here this morning, Lord Jesus, that you would fill needs, Lord God, that those that are struggling, those that are hurting right now, Lord Jesus, that you see them at their point of need, Lord God, and that you will respond, that you will touch them, Lord, that you will give them the answers that they need, Father. You will give them the emotional healing that they need, Lord God. You will give the physical healing that we need this morning, Lord. Mm. We commit our lives to you, Lord. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.